Hi, everybody. I'd love to introduce uh, Jacob Fish from Columbia University, who has done extensive work on the multi-scale modeling of well, various physical phenomena. Yeah, welcome, Jacob. Thank you, Greg. Um, should I start? Yes, please. OK. So I changed a little bit my title. Uh, it is uh, Towards Digital Twin for Integrated High Volume Manufacturing and Product Performance. OK. I'm a professor at Columbia University. I'm also director uh, of uh, Computational Science and Engineering Initiatives at Columbia University. Uh, that counts almost 100 faculty from uh, pretty much any department at Columbia University. And I'll tell a little bit about that. So what is, what is the uh, digital twin? Well, it's basically digital twin for in automotive industry. Um, and of course, this digital twin can be uh, in any kind of industry that involves uh, manufacturing and product design. So high volume manufacturing, lightweight manufacturing, you can see here on the left, uh, in this case, it's made of a carbon fiber. So obviously it's a, it's a multi-scale uh, material system. And, and the idea is how do you design this integrated system that will go all the way from manufacturing to product design. And it's today, it's a very, very hot topic uh, pretty much in any industry, including, uh, you know, the motive, I, I would like to point out, of course, uh, Tesla and in aerospace, obviously it's uh, Airbus, uh, Boeing, and, and so many other companies in other, in other industries as well. So uh, my interest is, of course, in computations. Uh, so we'll first would like to enumerate the computational challenges, which I will then try to address in my talk. So in the manufacturing, right, you, uh, and specifically I'm talking here, high volume manufacturing. In other words, how do you create parts very, very quickly? Because this is what we want to have. I want to create parts very quickly and want to create those parts without defects. So I'm talking about high, what is called high pressure resin transfer molding process, which was originally uh, used and developed by BMW uh, about 10 years ago. And the idea here is that you have a pump, uh, you have a mat, and you, in you inject the resin at a very, very high pressure. And we inject that resin very high pressure because you want to create this part very, very quickly. And what you're getting is that the average velocity in this mold, which I called was the superscript C, VC, is a nonlinear function of pressure gradient. And not only that, it's also a function of uh, saturation. And But it's a, it's a function of saturation, not this macroscopic saturation, but saturation of the micro scale. Solving a problem like that, a realistic problem like that, it's pretty much infeasible. And because of this highly nonlinear uh, relations here, We'll talk about how to do that in a computation efficient way. Once you get a part, once you get a solid part, now you need to quickly analyze that solid part, and it's a multi-scale part. This is also a very, very, very challenging problem. Uh, in order to really to calculate this kind of a stress strain relation or deformation gradient versus some other stress measure, you actually, at every point in the domain, you need to subject some strain measure or like in deformation gradient in, in, a, uh, in a more general uh, context, you, which will, will deform that material point. And you will need to solve a boundary value problem, a large deformation, inelastic boundary value problem very, very quickly. And you have to do that at every point in the entire uh, history of the problem domain. And that's, again, makes this whole process not feasible obviously supposedly very, very accurate, but computationally not feasible. The second challenge, huge challenge that we have is that the, the uh, as you will see, the, the main tool that we're using in, in making this process computation feasible is, is the process of homogenization upscape. The thing is that in many regions, this homogenization is not even valid because uh, for instance, in the case of the flow problem, molding problem, you have not only that you have high Reynolds numbers, but you have also high gradients of Reynolds numbers. 
And if you have high gradients of Reynolds numbers, it means that you have at least a very high second derivative of pressure gradients, uh, which, which are not included in the homogenization theory. And typically you will have this in the areas of uh, uh, boundary layers, uh, race tracking, uh, which, could, uh, co which could have a considerable problem domain the where homogenization is not uh, feasible. Now, if you look at the component, you can see that in the, in the very practical case, when you use this weaves as your, as, as your uh, underlying material, the, the size of the characteristic size of the material, as you can see here on the right-hand side, is of the same order of magnitude, or could be of the same order of magnitude of structural features. So what is a structure and what is a material is, is those scales no longer uh, separable which again makes the homogenization theory not bad. And then of course, the challenge of multiple physical processes at multiple scales. And that is the cure kinetics, crystallization, the thermal problem, the mechanical problem. Those problems are, uh, some of them are highly coupled and they're not coupled at the macroscopic scale, they're coupled at the microscopic scale. How do you really formulate this kind of problem? How do you, uh, address the computational challenges of dealing with multiple physical processes of multiple scale. So this is my goal. And, and, my, and the outline of my, of my talk today uh, will try to uh, address these this three major challenges that I just, just mentioned. I will start with this hybrid data physics driven uh, multi-scale approach for high pressure rays and transfer molding. I'll talk about a somewhat simpler model, which is the fully saturated pressure dependent model. Uh, and then I will also talk about the more generic model, general purpose model, which is a multi-phase, multi-scale flow model, which accounts for momentum exchange, uh, the uh, accounts for unsaturated flow based on the phase field, capillary pressures, and a variety of other uh, facts. I will then talk about the data physics driven reduced order homogenization for component analysis. I will address the issue of scale mixing. And, and finally, I will talk about this couple chemo thermomechanical reduced order multi scale model for predicting micro mechanical residual stresses and distortions, which actually need to be taken into account at the component level. I will finish with some conclusions. So let me start with this data physics driven multi scale approach for high pressure, means high volume raisin transfer molding. Uh, I already did briefly mention, show you some pictures. Uh, so this is the, the use of high pressure raisin transfer molding in the aerospace industry. This is the use of uh, high pressure raisin transfer molding in the automotive industry and variety of other industries as well. Uh, the idea, as I just, I just mentioned to you, you want to create parts quickly and you want to create them pretty much without any defects without any voids so let me start a little bit with the uh with the mathematical formulation uh so we have a mold uh we infuse the resin there is a mat in the mold and we're doing that at a very very high pressure so that we can uh, fill the mold very very quickly and we can cure it so we start with the Navier-Stokes equations, right? Um, and because the existence of multiple scales, uh, we need to rescale the equations so that we can use asymptotic expansion and we know what is big and what is, or what is small. Typically, most of the processes in, in this field, 99% oh, of the processes of the field are low pressure uh, fields. Uh, in the, and in, in the rescaling, of those equations with a low pressure, <laughs> we use certain rescaling where we assume that the pressure is of order one. In the case of high pressure, we actually assume that pressure is order xi, one over xi, uh, where xi is a small parameter. Then we employ asymptotic expansions and we get governing equations of different orders. The lowest order governing equation is essentially your unit cell problem, your or representative order problem which actually in the case of high pressure RTM turns out to be has this convective term, this nonlinear term. 
If you would if you would ignore this nonlinear term, which is in the case it would have a low pressure, you would you would what you would get in the end, you would get a classical Darcy's law linear equations. With the case of nonlinear equations, what you're essentially going to get in the end, you would get a permeability, which is a function of pressure gradient, and you would get some nonlinear relation between the average velocity and the pressure gradient. Then you would you would feed this information into the uh, macro scale problem, and which is basically a macro scale continuity equation, and you can using control volume approach, you can you can simulate mold filling problem. The challenge is, of course, the fact that the the field that you're going to be transferring into those mold filling problems are nonlinear terms. So this is just shows you that the that the average velocity, for instance is a nonlinear function of a pressure gradient. And you can also see that permeability is a highly nonlinear, is a highly nonlinear, or instantaneous permeability is a highly nonlinear function of the uh, pressure gradient as well. You can also see that even though the unit cell is symmetric, you're actually getting off diagonal terms. You're getting, you're getting off diagonal terms of permeability, which are very, very high of the same order of magnitude of diagonal terms. And it's not, it's, it's, it's actually uh, non-symmetric and it's highly nonlinear as opposed to the Stokes equation, which would give rise basically in this case for uh, zero of diagonal terms. Now, the beauty of, of the simplicity of this thing is that you know you have a unique solution in other words given pressure gradient uh given you can you can uniquely determine you can uniquely determine what would be the uh average velocity and what would be instantaneous probability so you can use neural networks here training and then use a surrogate uh to obtain one-to-one -one mapping between the uh pressure gradient, instantaneous permeability, and velocity. In fact, it's really, 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 really very easy. On my little laptop that I'm using here for my presentation, it takes about five minutes of training, and the accuracy of the surrogate uh, with respect to the analyzing the uh, the Navier Stokes equations is 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 99.9 percent. .9%, you know. For, for any kind of practical reason, this is, is, is way more than enough. Now, let me consider another very, very practical problem. <laughs> let me understand, actually. Yes. Uh, what you were just showing is these are just a three value thing. It's from, you know, what is it? Uh, the uh, pressure gradient and, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, the, you, given the pressure gradient, you're predicting average velocity instantaneous permeability, right? So this three value kind of model. It's it's you know it's it's from pressure gradient you can predict permeability and pressure gradient you can pre predict the uh, average velocity. Yes. Got it. So one, two, okay. One input, two outputs. Okay, so it is just like a pretty small scales. It's it's not a full simulation you're talking about. It's really that that one nonlinear relationship. It's really it's really the, in this case in this particular mm -hmm. case is very very simple. I'm going to talk about a more complicated model where relations are a little bit more complicated. Good, thank you. Okay, for three scales, um, again, you would start with the Navier Stokes equations. Uh, you would uh, you would again can calculate permeability of this micro scale. Typically, the intermediate scale would be the scale of a woven composite. Um, and you can calculate this permeability, could be pressure dependent permeability. Usually when this is a very, very small microstructure, uh, the pressure gradient is low. Very often the, the, uh, the convective term actually does not, uh, it, it, it does not uh, is, is, is no longer dominant and can be neglected. Now at the mesoscale, at the moment scale, now you basically have a uh, one medium which is a uh, which is a medium from which the flow can 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 move through. Uh, it's a porous medium, and the other and the other domain is a domain of uh, just the fluid or the resin. So basically, this kind of a simulation can be conducted using coupled Brinkman equation, which is shown here, and Navier-Stokes equation. 
right? So the Brink one equation is used for this porous medium. The uh, Lenevia Stokes equation is used for the fluid. And, and of course, there is a handshaking uh, in, in between them. Again, we, one can do homogenization theory, get, getting again uh, pressure dependent uh, instantaneous permeability and the uh, average velocity, and then feed that into the macroscopy problem. But again, as before, the solution here is unique. So again, it takes very little effort in using uh, neural networks uh, to train the surrogate and then successfully use the surrogate. Uh, even though the equations here are a bit more, uh, more complex, but it, again, it takes very little time to do the training and the accuracy between the Navia Stokes and the surrogate is very, very good. Uh, this is a mold feeling problem. We're comparing the full scale, uh, the Navia Stokes equation, right? And we're comparing this homogenization approach, nonlinear homogenization approach. Uh, you can see that the accuracy of this nonlinear homogenization and Navia Stokes equation is is uh is, is very 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 good if you were to use stokes equation instead of this nonlinear homogenization approach that i've shown you uh the you know you would have like 40 40 50 percent errors um and the computational cost of using this nonlinear homogenization approach is is uh, two or three orders of magnitude lower than just solving just solving native stokes equations at, at the most level uh, this is a three-dimensional mode feeling problem. Again, you can see a huge difference between doing this uh, data-driven uh, nonlinear homogenization and the and and, and simple Darcilo. Now, so far, I met, I ignored one very important thing. I ignored the fact that you may have some of the representative volume elements. It's those very high velocities uh, only partially filled. So there is some the unsaturated effect, unsaturation effect. So here I want to present a more general model, a much more uh, sophisticated model that I presented before. And it's a multi-phase, multi-scale model based on the phase field and, and, and accounting for capillary, capillary pressure. And this model uh, will also account for hysteresis effect which turns out to be very, very important and then actually complicates the problem quite a bit. Uh, today, there is no model that can actually do this kind of thing that will account for the hysteresis effect uh, in the mold feeling. And I'll explain to you what is, a, what is, the, um, what is this hysteresis effect. Uh, we will determine, not as, not as did it before, saturation dependent parameters also pressure dependent parameters saturation dependent parameters and as i just mentioned to you that this problem is history dependent there are four <laughs> there was a question here no oh, yeah. so the history dependent in the sense that as i will show in a moment for the same saturation level you may have multiple solutions uh, so we will employ gated recurring units neural network to efficiently link the micro and macro scales. And the starting point is not Navier-Stokes equation, is kahn heroed phase field model plus Stokes or Navier-Stokes equation at the pore scale, depending on whether you're talking about high pressures or low pressures. You have a combined quantities, which are function of the phase field. Uh, you have here basically four different fields. You have, again, velocity and pressure, as we had before. You have a chemical potential uh, that, uh, this, uh, that uh, from which you can calculate capillary pressure. And you have a phase field. And the phase field here is the phase field which at all, the, all the governing equations are always stated at the, at the smallest scale of interest. So the phase field itself which, which describes the level of saturation is, is being captured all the way from the finest scale to the, uh, to the coarser scale. So again, we use asymptotic expansions of all four fields. Uh, and this problem, unlike the previous problem, is also we use here space times asymptotic expansion. In other words, you have here, in addition to multiple spatial scales, you have multiple temporal scales in the, in the sense that at the fine scale, things are happening much, much faster 
at the unit cell level or representative of an element, then they are happening at the macroscopic level of, of the of the mold filling. And this this is a problem that I want to show you here. What you see here. Uh, in this figure here, you can see that there is a saturation-dependent capital repression. The red line shows here the wetting process. In other words, when, when the unit cell starts to fill in, the blue line shows the drainage process, right? And you can see that for the same level of saturations, you may have a different uh, chemical potential. Now, what you see here is the is the fast scale problem, uh, which we're which we can which we can solve uh, for the for the phase field. Um, the, we're solving this pro this problem until the uh, until the until we receive a stationary value of the phase field. This is the macroscopic problem. Uh, which is essentially a generalized two-phase the sea-like model for the mass con uh, cons uh, conservation between each of the two phases. Um, and again, because of the history dependence, we're using here a GRU neural network. A um, couple of uh, observations here. Uh, there is an issue here of the of the boundary layers uh that we can detect them by looking at the uh at the gradient of the Reynolds number or, or calculate some sort of normalized gradient of the Reynolds number and then we can uh define so-called error indicators which basically tell us where that gradient of Reynolds number is very high and in those regions we don't want to do any homogenization we actually want to use a full-scale navier slope solver Hopefully, there are regions that are very, very small, and then between them, we're going to be using some sort of a handshaking approach. Uh, and so this is just a cartoon shows this, the, the error indicators showing uh, at the outlet that you have uh, significant errors. And then in this small region around here, we actually put a navy stop solver, and we have a considerable reduction in the error by using this handshaking approach as opposed to just using nonlinear homogenization. So I'm going to quickly move to the second part of my talk, which is now we're moving to the solid part. And I want to talk about this multi-scale data physics driven reduced order homogenization for component analysis solids. And I'll talk about the, this uh, cure as, as the last part. Uh, I have done quite a bit of work in the uh, in in the physics-based uh, homogenization techniques, multi-scale techniques. I, I published a uh, this textbook, which I call "Practical Multi-Scaling." Uh, more recently, there are two works that came out just this year of how do you data-driven methods uh, to enhance this physics-based approach. Right. So I'm not going away from the physics. I'm just trying to enhance that. So we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll see how how this is done. So again, we we uh, we now dealing with the solid that cured as a result of manufacturing. Uh, let me for simplicity talk about the small deformation problem. Even though uh, just for simplicity, uh, we have equilibrium equation. We have the uh, kinematical equation where this the, which where this fine scale strain consists of the macroscopic strains plus something that comes from the fluctuations or perturbations. And we have a, a uh, and this very, very simple constitutive equation. Uh, stress is equal to the linear elastic properties of micro constituents times the total strain minus the eigenstrain. Now, the eigenstrain lumps into this all the inelastic phase transformation, thermal effect. All this is lumped into this, um, into this what I call eigenstrain. This is the scale bridging. The core scale strain is in an average of the fine scale strain uh, stress and the same thing for strains. And those are the average elastic properties. Now, at the heart of this approach that I will show you 
today is it's what it's called transformation field analysis. And the basic idea here is, is as follows. It says that the fine scale strain, which is the strain at the fine scale, can be obtained by the from the coarse scale strain and so-called uh, um, uh, strain concentration factor in the case that the problem is fully linear. And then all the effect of non-linearity of eigenstrain are coming from this term. And mu is again is this is this uh, transformation strain, which again includes the inelastic strain, phase transformation strain, thermal strain, all this thing is here. And what in the way that you kind and, and P is is called eigenstrain transformation functions. Mathematicians call the Green's functions. And we'll look at that. And the basic idea here is that if you induce some small change in volume or shape anywhere in the problem domain, this induces some fields away from that. The summation of all that is an integral, which basically this is how you construct your fine scale. So, so, the, so the fine scale strain basically comes from those little volume changes that can be introduced by plastic strains, uh, uh, phase transformation, thermal strains, and, and those P's are easily, can be easily pre-calculated. Now, what this equation does, it does the following. The core scale strain basically comes from the macroscopic problem. So this is known if you, if once you solve the macroscopic problem. So this part is known. This part, the Eichen strain is not known. But what it does, it, it, it expresses unknown strains, not in terms of the, uh, derivatives of the displacements or gradients of the displacements which is typical relation but it expresses that in terms of the eigenstrains so it's a transformation of the problem from unknown displacements to unknown eigenstrains so let me see if i can simplify this down just to make sure i get this so normally you would say you have the micro scale you might start you're pushing it around the molecules and you're going to get crashed you're going to get you know brittleness the molecules are going to get you know, pushed out of whack but here the yes, approximation is um all the well the the key like the uh what's it called it, the, the, the changes in molecule shape and pressure the, the fine scale depends on the large scale stresses and strains like you push you push the entire vo your volume and the micro scale of pushing molecule to, to the side does not matter and what you don't know is how different magnitudes or shapes of of macro strains like, uh, propagate down to the micros, the eigenstrains. It's, it's kind of like a, I'm interpreting the term eigenstrains. You have different scales, each of which has a, you need to have a multiplier to see how how much it translates to the micro scale. Um, well, I, I think maybe in, in the big picture is okay. I mean, the only thing that is is is, is probably you should not talk as about molecules. Okay. Uh, because you know, I'm focusing here on continuum theory, right? So, that, so we're we're dealing here with continuum. Where uh, I have done a lot of work on going from molecules to continuum, but this is not part of this presentation. So here we view we view everything as a continuum. Either fluid is a continuum, solid is a continuum. We don't deal with molecules, right? Okay. So yeah. So that that that's the intuition that fit in my head. What's a good what's a good intuition for your your system where where this assumption would break? Like what phenomena are you not modeling here? Um, well, you know, unless you're dealing here with uh, nano devices, unless you're dealing mm -hmm. here with uh, with features which are uh, at the you know at at this at, at the molecular scale, usually you know manufacturing processes and 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 uh you know component design processes so usually everything is is smeared out in other words uh we don't see individual molecules and 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 their representation and their their effect is coming in the, those constitutive equations so a lot of uh, a lot of uh the effect of these of the molecular behavior is sitting in this eigen strength it's true mm -hmm. right but the, there are there are so many steps 
between how do you translate that molecular behavior into this eigen strain that it's uh, it probably a, uh, about 25 lectures on its own right Got it. Got it. so but but in in that sense yes so so the, this eigen strain is is basically the devil right that it's, mm -hmm. it's but but rather than expressing the strain which is basically the derivative of displacement right you now express that in terms of uh, of this right? mm -hmm. so uh let me also make perhaps a comment i used to have a company right uh, I, I i had a company uh that you know this multi-scale company which was based at the heart was based on this equation right the, the company was then acquired by altair which is a multi-billion dollar company and and pretty much everybody using those products in solid mechanics all of them based on this equation and and the reason that it's based on this equation is the following the eigenstrains can be discretized right rather than having you have unknown eigenstrain at every point in the in your domain you can do a discretization typically like you would discretize displacements velocities pressures etc you can also discretize the eigenstrains right now how are you going to be discretizing that obviously if you're going to discretizing that at a fine 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 scale right with uh, with with uh, you will get a very very computationally intensive model that you know you cannot analyze components and that and, you know real components real structures real manufacturing processes if you would discretize that at a very very fine scale so uh, the idea here is to say, well, can I discretize that in the most coarsest possible? So if let's say two materials, I have a resin and I have a carbon fiber. I will say in my unit cell, the entire carbon fiber is just have one partition. So it has six unknowns because I can say in a sec symmetric second order tensor. The entire resin in, the, in this microscopic unit cell is also constant. You can use very, very inexpensive model. And this, this was how my company used to do the product. The thing is, is that when you do this kind of very, very coarse discretization, not only that the accuracy is going down, but there is also it, the, the solution for certain modes of, of discretization, of certain modes of behavior, the solution locks. Um, and there are many, many problems in, 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 in physics where solution locks, you know, in compressibility is one of them. Uh, there is a bending phenomenon. I mean, the, the literature is full of stories about what happens when the discretization is very, very coarse. You miss a lot of things. I mean, and you miss them in a big way. So this is just a cartoon, basically, say, well, if you assume that the eigenstrain is constant in this resin domain, which means that when the resin deforms and if, and if the inclusion is elastic, it, it forces this elastic inclusion to become elliptic. And it doesn't want to be because it's, it's very, very stiff and, and the whole thing locks. So in many, many papers that I published and, and my co-authors and, and, and everybody that followed my work, uh, rather in this matrix dominated mode to, to alleviate locking, there were some tricks that have been done, right? Like we always do tricks in compressibility in many, many things. The thing is that by doing so, we violate all kinds of other principles. And in, in the end, you know, it's the best that we can do is physics. So the idea was to say, okay, well, those transformation functions uh, that we use from physics that satisfy equilibrium equations, et cetera, et cetera, when the discretization is very, very coarse, they really don't really work very well. And, and any kind of tricks that you do introduce all kind of artifacts. So the idea was then to say, okay, can we use machine learning to say, to identify what should be that model reduction? And I'm just telling you that in a, in a, so that you know you would you would get you know phenomenal behavior with very few res computational resources now this phenomenon here in solids you know when you do with an elasticity you do with all these things that you that's it's very very complex it's history dependent 
highly history dependent. So basically here what we do, we, um, we use a high fidelity model. Very, very think about if, you, if you're not a solid person, you use, you, you, you use a, you know, a full scale Navier-Stokes equation. So we do at, 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 at a very, very fine scale, you have here uh, multiple constituents, even though this is the solid mechanics. So we use some other high fidelity model in solid mechanics. And it and it's uh, and it basically we 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 create this history, this macroscopic history behavior, and then we train the gated recurrent unit, unit neutral neural network surrogate to this physics-based, very very expensive physics-based solver, or you can actually train that to physical experiments if you have them. And then we and then we use the surrogate in the in the context of Bayesian inverse because in Bayesian inverse you have to do many many forward simulations many many forward simulations so rather than doing forward simulations with uh, with this high fidelity model which is extremely time consuming you're doing this with the surrogate with a GRU with with a GRU based surrogate. And then out of that, you basically obtain the, the probabilities of, uh, of what is that model reduction should have been in order to get this best possible. So you're getting probabilities. So this, what, it, what is called this transformation tensor with that, so the eigenstrain transformation tensor. And then in the multi-scale calculations, you no longer use the surrogate because the surrogate usually is not very good for extrapolation. We actually now using again this reduced order physics based solver with those data driven parameters, model reduction parameters that we identify through Bayesian inverse. And we then do this component level predictions. So this is the new thing. Uh, I'm not going to go into numerical examples. It, it, it really behaves so much better than anything anybody has done in the past. Again, those papers just appeared this year. I'm going to skip on that. Wait, so just in the, same, the, the kind of thing you you were doing, you you train a neural net on a high fidelity model in a limited region of its behavior space. Then you division solver to pick better parameters for the high fidelity model, and then you retrain the neural net again in the new region of the uh, parameter space. No. No. Okay. No. I did not understand that cycle. No. So I use a high fidelity model or actual physical data right to get what should be the correct macroscopic behavior this is done in this box here okay oh wait so, a minute this is what i missed i think what i missed is that the parameter space you're using for your training is actually bigger it includes anything the Bayesian inference is going to try is that fair um the, the the parameter space the parameter space that i want to identify consists of those model reduction parameters mm -hmm. And it also consists of some material properties, microstructural properties, which I didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't want to complicate things here too much. Because sometimes we cannot really measure those little things. So we also define them. So the, so epsilon theta theta, those are eigenstrain transformation functions. Uh, theta MCM, those are microstructural material parameters, which we cannot measure directly. So right. all this set now, so we take the history, sigma C was epsilon C, which basically comes either from the physical experiments. So those are not infinite amount of loadings. Those are some set of six, seven loadings that we apply on this representative volume element. And then we run the, we run the surrogate and, and, and we, run this, the, we run the surrogate to, for all possible, uh in for the space of those parameters on so, the history of the loading which we already know from either experiments or from high fidelity model so how many runs of the high fidelity model do you need um uh, high fidelity model no for high fidelity model very little okay so, so in this case we only run six load cases ah okay so high fidelity model runs very very little Got it. The, okay. what, what runs them is the surrogate this model and the physics based rom which is the which is very simple models 
Mm -hmm. Then they run on all the possible parameters here in all this parameter space. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. Thank right. you. Right. So this is not expensive. This this mm -hmm. whole thing is. A, I mean, the expensive part is the fact that this is a history dependent thing, right? Mm -hmm. So there is no one to one mapping, and in solids, it's it's really, uh, it, it's really really bad. This history dependence. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, a little bit about scale mixing. I don't know whether you're actually interested in this thing, but in many, many cases, homogenization is really not valid. So for instance, um, typically for the homogenization to be valid, the unit cell, there, there should be scale separation. So the microstructure, which sits at the quadrature points, uh, should be extremely small. But in many cases, this microstructure is not very small. So the idea was to say, well, I want to create a so-called computational continuum domain. And I asked myself, is it possible to integrate on this domain, the whole domain, where you have very, very, very large microstructure? And the problem that I pose the following, can we modify Gauss quadrature by saying that, that the unknowns are the position of those cells, which are gonna be a function of the size of the unit cell and the weights that are associated for arbitrary large microstructures. And it turns out to be, it is possible. Uh, we have shown that in one dimension and multiple dimensions, all what it does, it basically changes the, the, the Gauss quadrature uh, positions and the Gauss quadrature weights. Let me just leave it like that. I call that as a non-local quadrature. And this way, we actually can run microstructures of very large size. We can large microstructures where gradients are very, very large. Um, it does add some complexity in the in the formulation. It adds that at the point you also need to calculate, so not just for stresses, but the gradients of stresses, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just shows you a toy problem. Uh, uh, you know, you have a hole in the form of dolphin. And if you look at the points at the at the tip of the dolphins, that's where the points of the concentration, those are singularities, actually, right? So in those points of singularity with this approach, we're actually getting a very accurate solution was a classical homogenization you don't. And we, we have been using this thing quite a bit. Let me also say now, uh, this is the last part of my talk, which is the couple chemo, thermo, mechanical, multi-scale model for predicting the effects of manufacturing on the product itself, because especially now that you do this manufacturing very very fast you're going to create voids you're going to you're going to introduce defects and you really need to be able to control and if there is something that is induced there you you want to make sure that it's carried on into the component analysis uh here we consider different materials we consider semi-crystalline polymers we consider uh, amorphous polymers uh there are multiple works here uh so uh, chi is the degree of cure, uh, de uh, degree of crystallinity or degree of cure. Theta is the, is the thermal effect. Mu is the, is the displacement, so that's mechanical problem. All those problems are highly coupled at the, at, at the micro scale. Um, and um, we, we basically developed uh, a model for that. Uh, we can we can basically calculate this process. Uh, we can calculate the eigen strain, which is now gonna gonna include the phase transformation effect, the thermal effect, and we can bring this information into the uh, component analysis uh, that I have shown you in the earlier. Uh, so those are go going from Hempcon's free energy going into uh, constitutive equations etc etc this is the work that we have been doing with general motors uh, uh illustrate the importance of using multi-scale approach in other words none of the approaches today can actually predict the defects at the microstructure they all predict the defects at the larger scale and here we show that predicting the defects at the microstructure you're actually getting much much better predictions 
if you ignore those defects. Uh, this again, this was the work that we did on GM with their new, uh, with the new vehicles. Uh, this is a Chevy Malibu uh, 2024 that is planned to be. This is the new design, which is made of uh, um, uh, carbon, uh, fib uh, uh, carbon fiber composite subjected to uh, side impact. Uh, some, of the, some of the technology that I've shown you today went into analysis of, of this underbody assembly. Uh, we were able to get a stronger component with a reduction of weight 16 kilograms from 64 kilogram uh, the current design in GM to uh, 48 kilograms uh, and being being much much stronger means that it's also uh, you get a car that that weights less which means it's also uh, affects the fuel efficiency of the car so weight is 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 important from the fuel efficiency point of view. Some conclusions, uh, data physics driven multi-scale flow model can reasonably well match the direct navius stoke solver in the medium to high pressure regime with little overhead in comparison to classical Darcy solver. Multi-phase multi-scale flow model is necessary to account for momentum exchange, hysteresis, history effect, capital repression effect that I've shown you before, Multi-scale model of pure crystallization kinetics is necessary to resolve micromechanical residual stresses, which affect component design. And scale separation free multi-scale method with relatively little overhead of the classical computational homogenization methods necessary in the vicinity of hotspots. I also predict that uh, commercial grade data physics driven multi-scale software for integrated process performance design or a digital twin along the lines that I presented probably can be developed uh, within five to seven years. Uh, the last thing that I want to show you, I'm directing this Computational Science and Engineering Center at Columbia University. We have over 80 faculty from different departments, uh, research collaboration, uh, we have a membership, and of course we also have educational effort uh, we deal with climate, uh, data-driven method, pretty much everything in, uh, in, uh, in science and engineering. Um, and of course, we have a uh, member affiliates program. So that's, that's my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer. Well, thank you very much. Um, one part of the, the big overriding question is you have many lessons about how to create neural surrogates and you went from the very simple ones which are a couple of parameters to more complex uh models so i guess what 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 was difficult about it and where do you see it being easier more practical um Look, I to be to be as a practitioner, and even though I'm, I'm I may look very very theoretical, but as I said, I, I have done quite a bit entrepreneurship was was running a sizable company by by being a professor. Um, I think that we should at least initially embrace simple things. Um, uh, you know, things are complicated already quite a bit. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I, I think that those simplistic models with very few parameters and doing some other things, more, maybe more on the phenomenological, uh, at the more phenomenological level, is probably the right way or intermediate way to go about. Um, what do you mean by phenomenological? So, okay. So everything that I presented today is, is all multi-scale. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, you, you actually, the beauty of the multi-scale process is that you define the equations, you define your mathematical problem at the scale where you understand that very well. Mm -hmm. Right. When you have those mixtures, you don't know exactly how they behave together. Right. But you understand how each constituent behaves. So you understand mathematical model very well. Right. Mm -hmm. There may be a lot of uncertainty, right? Which is which is the geometry and stuff like that, which which is which is always a headache. But uh, but it, when but when you understand equations very well, you can do rigorous mathematics, and you can go from here, and you can go and you can go to predictions. 
Uh, but the upscaling process itself is computationally very, very challenging, right? And it becomes more and more challenging when you have more and more uncertainty and when, you, when, and when the model is more and more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. I think today we do not have computational power to go from the micron scale which is the scale at which I define my governing equation to the scale of a car or scale of the airplane. We just right. do not have computational power. I, I have shown that the, the data-driven stuff is very, very, very helpful, very mm -hmm. helpful. But it, 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 and in particular, when the solutions are unique, mm -hmm. when the mathematical model is unique, when the mathematical model is not unique, um, the complexity of tracing the history, and, 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 because it's essentially, essentially, because it's a history dependent, there are going from A to Z, there are infinite number of paths by which you can go, right? Training this thing to infinite number of paths is, is, is really, is really very challenging. Right, is very, very, very challenging. So therefore, there there must be some sort of a physics and taking advantage of physics to really to simplify this thing. And at the moment, in some cases, I feel that it can be done where this inf there where this inf impact in in um, in history dependence is secondary. For example, in the flow problem. Right, the the whole the whole effect of the hysteresis, and and the dependence of hysteresis primarily comes due to the to the all the bifurcation that happened at a very small scale, at the scale of 10, 20 microns, mm -hmm. and scale of a capillary pressure. The gross effect on that on the component is not very huge, right? It's it's it, we know that it's not very large, so. Yes, we can we can do a good job in this in this case because the effect of that is not huge, but like in solids, uh, you're talking about phase transformation, you're talking about plasticity, and and the material behave under this trioxo loading uh, was was this it was this more general case damageable debate, uh, material that experienced damage material that is uh, ductile failure is so complicated. That yeah, that um, it's um, it remains to be seen whether something like that is is will find its way into this robust engineering software that that or or not. I think we're doing we're 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 having progress, mm -hmm. but it's it's still it's still. Um, Still, it's still too early to say where we're gonna where we we'll end up with this. So the models you're using, the, the neural net models, are seem to be fairly generic, uh, and you're training them on kind of it sounds like more restricted problems where you think you're gonna have more luck. Uh, to what extent is um, knowledge of the physical processes that you can bake into the structure of the neural net, the training set is gonna run, the loss function? Yes. How much can you bias it? And you know, huge, how, huge, how, huge, huge. I mean, you know, I to me. I'm not a data science person. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm more numericist, uh, you know, mechanician stuff like that. Um, uh, so to me, the data-driven aspect came in where I realized that it can be helpful. I don't mm -hmm. develop data-driven methods. I basically basically use off-the-shelf programs, right? Right. Uh, but I, to my surprise, I found it very useful. Right. Um, really very useful. And, um, but they found it very useful as something that can solve little problems. You know, I, I don't, I, I, I do not, I do, I do not believe that you actually can use data driven method alone, but to solve some different modules where, where really it, you know, to do computationally effective simulation or a, on a certain part is, is just not worth it. Right. right just not worse right when like in this case like in the constitutive equation which is one of the equations remember i mean there are many equations. there is equilibrium right. 
We satisfy equilibrium. There is a kinematical equation. There are boundary conditions. We maintain all that. But there is this constitutive equation for which if I were really to resolve that very, very accurately, I would need to uh, go maybe to molecular scale, atomic scale, yeah. to do any of this thing, right? I just want to do, you know, input output, input output. And it's, it's really worthwhile doing that. So all those equations which we are in the past trying to hide them and this and not really understand how to do that, that's, that's where AI is in machine learning is, is so effective. Uh, in some cases, again, when, when there is a huge history dependence, and we have been using this gated recurrent units approach, right? Again, I, I'm not developer of that, right? I, I'll be right. sure my students use that, and, and we're looking at this loss function where you can, will, they're actually teaching me how to do that. Mm -hmm. they, they have taken all those courses, right? I, I just read some papers how to do those things. Um, it it is uh, it is very useful, um, and uh, and we'll see how it will pan out. I mean, for for those more complicated cases. Lucas, and then what's a I mean, I'm not asking about the communities, right? So you have uh, people who kind of have an idea of how, in general, the system in question works. You have people who just you know have data driven methods to explore it without a whole lot of prior knowledge. So if you were to to inject data drivenness into a, you know, a suite of simulations, what would be the kind of the verbs and nouns that would make sense to you? Would you say this subroutine, I don't know how to write it, or this three parameters, I, I, I unknown, figure it out for me. Or like, what would be the kind of stuff you would say about the constraints that you know, and then say that these parts are unknown? Yeah. And I think that we have we have identified uh, you know certain things that um, obviously the constitutive equations right they identifying uh, material properties uh, which cannot be measured directly, but we also have done that in the solid mechanics we have said to, my, to ourselves okay we can actually do even more than that we said can we actually use machine learning to do a better model reduction. Okay. And that that part was uh, was was revealing. I mean, we we were able to improve the model reduction itself, which is basically a physics based model reduction, right? We were able to. We had some constraints. We knew there there were some constraints on those functions uh, that had to be satisfied in the model reduction itself, right? Compatibility and stuff like that, because there, there are certain things that need to be satisfied, but. Other than that, so we enforce those constraints, um, but you know we were able to find a better model reduction. Again, why did we want to do model reduction? Because we want to do it much much quicker, right? So uh, to do a model reduction going from many 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 unknowns to to a very small number of knowns, huge model reduction. That's where that's where we found that this machine learning was really very very helpful to uh, to do that step. Okay, Mikhail, so you provide a complex model, and you're looking for a much simpler approximation of the model, which neural network you want to how to find that simpler approximation. That's you know, again in in certain modes of deformation, right? So it's not that you found the whole thing, but we found that in certain modes of deformation, like in this case of matrix dominated mode. This, this simplistic model reduction, physics-based model reduction, experience certain phenomena of locking. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we were in the past doing those physics-based methods to alleviate that locking in the case of model reduction. And they were kind of, ah, okay, I mean, better than nothing, right? Uh, but this time we, we actually gave that to the machine and say, well, tell us what is the best bet. <laughs> These are, the, these are the resources that we want to use in this multi-scale analysis. Tell me, tell me what, uh, what is the best model reduction I can do with this amount of resources that I want to use. So in this case, was we want to use those, this very strong model reduction. We don't want to do anything, you know, that it's still going to be computation complex. Tell us what is to do the, the best model reduction. And it, it was very successful. Interesting. So one more question. Um, 
So you have a model reduction from that you derived, you know, like analytically, uh, the based on some theoretical idea of what should happen versus the data-driven one. They're both wrong, and they're both wrong under different and challenging conditions. I guess how can you establish confidence under both regimes, what you derive versus the model, you know, data like ML created it, confidence the of the regime when it is accurate enough. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a very, very good question. Uh, how do we know if it's accurate enough or not? Um, basically, we, we, we always use this high fidelity model for some very simplified scenarios uh, that we use methods which have no model reductions, like using maybe a Stokes on the whole heterogeneous domain. So we, we have something equivalent to that in solid mechanics. Uh, and then we, of course, we, we can supplement that by the actual physical data, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, uh, we take a component, uh, not me, but uh, my colleagues. Uh, this is why I work with uh, a lot of people in industry. Uh, my colleagues, uh, have, you know, G has, GM has huge lab in Detroit. Uh, probably the lab is bigger than many cities. Uh, and uh, and then they do those experiments. I mean, they they basically said, Jacob, whatever you want, we'll do for you. Uh, right. You know, I help them to to create better products, and and they provide the resources for me to uh, to do the physical testing. Well, not me; they actually do physical testing with themselves. Got it. Well, yeah. Thank you very much. It was fascinating.